Hey, welcome. Today we're going to be talking through some of the major ideas you need to know if you are an AP Physics C Mechanics student. If you're going to be going into AP Physics C, or maybe you're already in the class, and you need to know a little bit about the basics of calculus as it's used for AP Physics C Mechanics, that's what we're going to start going through here. So this is the first of five series and I want to present mainly just the material you need to know. It's outside the scope of this video in this series to talk about everything that, say, a calculus teacher would talk about in terms of building up and giving you reasons why. I'm going to show you what you need to know in a succinct and hopefully straightforward way. So that's the plan. And in this lesson in particular, we're going to be talking about how to think about derivatives up to the chain rule. So first of all, let's talk about what a derivative looks like, what a derivative is, and I'm going to play this quick little animation here that's helpful in understanding what's going on. So if we think about what's going on here, you could say there's a function, that U-shaped curve on this graph. You don't see the Y-axis on this graph, but we can think of it as a graph. And we can think of this secant line turning into a tangent line. A tangent line is a line that touches a curve at only one point. The delta x gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and you actually get a better approximation of an instantaneous slope value. And there are reasons for this, and there are proofs you can do with this, but that's generally what's happening. So if you take the derivative of this function, then you will get a second function, a derivative of the original function, which will allow you to put in numbers and get the value for the instantaneous slope at any given point in that function. And importantly here, we would say we can do this because the delta x becomes infinitesimally small. It's a limit as it approaches zero, is what we would say, as long as you can follow along with that idea as delta x gets smaller and smaller and basically becomes a point, then we can get an instantaneous value for that delta x and that delta y and calculate rise over run. We can calculate delta y over delta x, which is the slope at any instantaneous point on this function when we put in a certain value for our variable. So that's the basis of this. And the rule for this is called the power rule. So the power rule is going to be this right here. So you could say d dx, or sometimes you would say dy dx, where d in this case is delta, delta y over delta x. And what that means is change in y over change in x, which is the same basic function of slope, so to speak. So we're just using dy dx, or sometimes another variable up top, to signify the rise over run in a very, very small unit of time. So let's go back to the default equation for derivatives, which is known as the power rule, where x to the n, so this is going to be our function right here, and so we're going to take the derivative of this function. That would mean we would find a function such that if you plugged in a value for x, then you would get the instantaneous slope at that x value on that graph, right? And if we were to look at an example, if you thought of the power as being n, let's say, so this is your power right here, you would take the power, you would take that n value. So we start with a 5, and you bring the 5 out in front. Like you can see right here, you bring that initial n value gets distributed out in front times x to the fourth. So the derivative of x to the fifth is 5x to the fourth. And that is how you would basically go about using the power rule. There's some other rules as we get started that you should become aware of. The first one is called the sum rule. And all that states is if you want to take the derivative of two functions that are added together, like we have here, and here, you just take the derivative of each of them individually and add them together. So if we wanted the derivative of x squared plus x to the third, then we would take the derivative of the x squared function, which would be 2x, and the x to the third would become 3x squared, because you would take that initial n value right here, n equals 3 right here, you would distribute that down in front right here, and you would take that initial n value and subtract it by 1 and put that right here and that's going to be essentially your power rule. So this is just adding up multiple derivatives together 
Um, similarly, we can say that you're going to have a similar thing going on with the difference rule. And so let's go back and take a look at a couple examples here and see if you can do this. If you would like to pause right now and take a look at this example problem and see if you can do an example power rule problem, please go for it. What would be the derivative of 2x to the third? So do the best you can. All right, the derivative of 2x to the third would be, now notice you would bring the n value, the exponents, out. So it would be 3 times 2 to the x, and then you would subtract one value from the previous n value. So that would be to the 2. So what is that equal to? Well, that would be equal to 6x squared. How about if we take a look at number 3 over here? Think about the graph of some constant, like x equals 5. What is its slope? What would be the slope for another constant? Why is this rule a thing? All right, so if we think about it, if we have, actually, now that I think about this, let's change this to y equals 5 to make it a little more helpful. Why would this slope be, let's see, what is its slope? What would the slope be for another constant? Let's say y equals 3. All right, so what would that be? Well, if this is 0, if this is 3, and say this is 5 right here, all it's going to be is a flat line. And hopefully you know at this point, if you think about it, what the slope, a rise over run, the slope, flat line, would be essentially 0. And why is that? Well, that's because this rise is going to be your delta y value over a delta x. And this is going to be 0 for a flat line. So that's what was intended by the question, not x equals 5, but let's call that y equals 5. So anytime you have the derivative of some constant, you can essentially ignore that. All right, let's continue and take a look over here. Our difference rule, we do have an example that you can take a moment to look at that. You just notice that if you have a function where you take the derivative of two terms here, there's one subtracting another, then you just take the derivative of each of those and subtract the derivative of each of those. All right, let's continue and talk about a couple other things. This is actually quite important here, I would say. And so it just states that if you have a constant multiplying a function, if you, if you take a function and you multiply it by some constant, then when you take the derivative of that, you can just draw the constant out. So it's actually easier to see with the example down here, what I'm talking about, then with the nomenclature we have up here. But you're going to take the 3, just take the 3 outside of this here, and you just say, well, that's the same thing as 3 times the derivative of x to the 5th, which would be like 3 times 5 times x to the 4th, which would be the same as 15 x to the 4th. So that's called the constant multiple rule. So if we take a look at this, like number 5 over here, we would say what would be the derivative of this? Well, we could just draw the 4 out, so that would be 4 times dy dx, or just d dx, of over here. What's this that we have left is this over here. So we would say 4 times 2x. Well, what is that equal to? That is equal to 8x. All right, and so let's take a look at the product rule next. So what we're going to do is... Imagine that we want to take the derivative of two functions that are multiplied together. So we've got two different functions here, f of x and g of x. They're multiplied together. And if you want to take the derivative of that, the way you would do that is you would take the derivative of the first. So if I label this as like our first, so I could call this f of x right here. So you would say another way to write that would be f prime of x times g of x over here plus and then we would take the derivative of the g of x another way of writing that would be g prime of x times f of x and if we were going to take an example and take a look at an example of this we would say let's imagine over here we've got our two functions i could label this as one and this is two so you get the idea to be able to find the derivative of their product, you would take the derivative of the first times the second equation. And so that's what we have over here, the derivative of the first. And we're setting this up, we solve for the derivative of the second. Now notice the derivative of sine of x is the cosine of x. We will talk more about this later, actually later in this lesson. There's a lot to that. There's a good set of exercises you can do to prove this to yourself and understand why this is. 
But for now, we're just going to accept that that is the case because proving it is outside the scope of this video right now in terms of time. So if we take a look down here, you would take the derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. And that's what we have essentially right here with this business that you can see over here. So this is actually important. This is something that you're going to need to know how to do and you should practice. And importantly, this is not on your equation sheet. So this is just something you're going to need to get used to. All right, next up we have the quotient rule. I'm going to show it here and I'm going to allow you to pause it and take a look if you'd like and see what's going on with the example. But I would say don't bother with the quotient rule actually. What you're going to do is use the product rule and anything in the denominator you're going to treat as having a negative exponent because if you do that it's the same thing. In other words you can just learn the product rule and apply it in a somewhat different way and you're going to be able to do the same thing. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. If we have f of x is equal to 6 over x squared x squared in the denominator would be like the same thing as saying 6 times x to the negative 2 power. And then what you can do with this constant rule is just bring this 6 out here, take the derivative of x to the negative 2, you still take this n value and you still subtract 1, so you get a negative 3 even if you start with a negative number. You do need to bring the negative 2 down, so negative 2 times 6 gives you 12 out in front, and you end up with negative 12x to the negative 3 power. That is how we would highly, highly, highly recommend that you do this type of problem here. All right, a couple more derivative functions before we get into some example problems here of things you just need to memorize. And again, there are reasons for this that are outside the scope of this screencast. But if we take a look at this, this is one that you're going to need to understand how to use. This is actually on your equation sheet. That's really important. So you would say the derivative of the sine of x is equal to the cosine of x. And there's a little bit of a wrinkle in the version that you have on your equation sheet. This is on your equation sheet right here. So I'm just going to write that in. That's, that's what you would see on your equation sheet, that a comes out in front. So if we start with a out in front here, that a gets distributed out in front, and then you end up with a times the cosine of ax as the derivative of the sine of ax. Now similarly, the cosine function is going to be like what you saw above, but it does have a negative sign, and that is really important to remember to add that in. However, this is on your equation sheet. Really crucial that you take a look at your equation sheet for AP Physics C, and you'll see these things on your equation sheet. So please make use of them. The amount of calculus you need is not overwhelming. You can do well on this test without knowing that much calculus. And those equations are there to help you. All right, a couple more that you're going to need to know, really crucial here. If you have a natural log function, the derivative of that is going to give you that function in the denominator, like you can see over here. And the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. That deserves a whole lesson in and of itself why that is. I'm just going to throw that out there. That is something that you'll need to know. And we're going to get to some example problems. So let's go ahead and take a look at some example problems here really quickly. Pause this if you want to do 6, 7, and 8 on your own, and then I'll talk you through them. All right, so if we're looking at 6, this number 10 right here is a constant. So we can essentially ignore anything that's a constant. So that essentially goes away because a derivative of a constant is just 0. What we do, so we say f prime of x is going to be equal to 7x to the 6 over here. So that's how you would do number 6. Okay, and so let's take a look at number 7, how we would do this. First of all, we can ignore the constant, of course. This 3 is our n value, so that gets distributed out in front. And so that would be 3 times 5, which would be 15x. We subtract the 1, so we would say x squared. This is going to be f prime of x is equal to this. Now the question becomes, what do we do with the negative x? That becomes a negative 1. So you can think of it as a 1 gets distributed out in front of the x. 
and then you would end up with an x to the zero power. So you do end up with a negative one here. If it was a positive x, you take the derivative of that, you would end up with a positive one, so to speak. But that's going to be our answer here. Let's take a look at number eight. Number eight, the answer is going to be similar. You're going to have four times two, that is eight times x minus seven. So we'll say f prime of x is equal to this. All right, let's do a couple more examples. If you have a moment, I would say please pause this. Just see if you can do this on your own, and then we'll do that middle problem. 8x to the fourth plus 9x to the second. What is that in terms of its derivative? Pause for a second, please, if you can. All right, so that's going to be f prime x is equal to 32x to the third plus 18x. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at this one over here. So this is a more complex problem. And a lot of times when you have something like this right here with a denominator function, you want to take a moment to put them in a way that's going to make sense. So you could say f of x, f prime of x rather, is going to be 4x to the third plus. Now we want to think of this x, in this case, you could say 1 over x is the same thing as x to the negative 1, right? So then that would be like saying, take the derivative of 2x to the negative 1, and so you could say f prime of x is equal to 4x to the third minus 2x, because that n value is negative 1, and it's going to be negative 2x to the negative 2 value. All right, and the last one, we're just going to think about how this would work. First of all, we need to deal with this root up top. So that x value, that would be x to the 1 half power plus 2x divided by 7x minus 4x squared. All right, so we'll say f of x. Well, what is that like? Well, we could say x to the 1 half power plus 2x times 7x minus 4 4x squared to the negative 1 power. So I'm showing you another example where if you have a division problem, you can turn it into a multiplication problem and then just master one rule, which is the product rule, and you'll be able to do that. You do need something else here as well, which is the chain rule, which is the topic for my next lesson. So hopefully you've enjoyed this. If you have any comments down below, I will put a link to the next lesson when I get a chance, and I hope you all have a great day. Take care.